أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد My dear respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير for joining us uh, tonight, we are going to have, as we announced yesterday, a, a special program. As we try every Saturday to uh, bring to the community uh, a, a different speaker, uh, a different organization, in order to introduce organizations, different organizations to the community, but also to educate ourselves about uh, topics and subjects that really matter to us as a community. And tonight, inshallah, we have with us our dear brother, Dr. Abdel Malik Bu'ul, and uh, he is very well known, uh, but I have to introduce him uh, because most of us know him as a, a, a young, active brother in the community, but we have no idea about uh, uh, his credentials, about his professional life. That's why I would like to introduce him uh, formally. Uh, however, I'm not going to read everything uh, 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 that is included in his bio. Otherwise, I will take half of the time of the presentation. So who is Dr. Abdel Malik Bull? He is an award-winning professor, anti-racist activist, progressive practitioner, and emancipatory educator. He is an innovative dynamic leader within the San Diego community and throughout the state of California. He completed his bachelor's degree in sociology and a master's degree in education with an emphasis in community-based counseling and social justice, both from the San Diego State University. And he completed his doctorate work in educational leadership with an emphasis in educational psychology from the University of Southern California, USC. He is now a professor and transfer center director in the counseling department at the San Diego City College. Dr. Abdel Malik Burul is also a lecturer at San Diego State University where he teaches restorative practices and conflict transformation to students in the advanced graduate certificate, certificate in mental health recovery and trauma-informed care. A uh, master in education with concentration in counseling program. He serves as a task force member on the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges equity, diversity, and action committee, and on and on and on, um, without going through different organizations where he sit as a member, as a president, as a vice president, without going through uh, so many articles and research that he uh, uh, published mainly on issues related to anti-racism, uh, social justice, racial justice, restorative, just, uh, restorative justice practices, leadership and community development, and so on. But the most important thing to know about our guest speaker tonight is that he is the second oldest of 13 and is a proud father of a two-year-old daughter named Selma, like my daughter. And, I, and I've seen Selma on Facebook. And I can tell you that he is so proud of Selma and has been married for seven years. I can't believe this, seven years. Okay, it was just yesterday, I remember, <laughs> seven years to his wife and nurse practitioner, Sudi. Masha Allah, Masha Allah. 
Dr. Abdel Malik, we are so proud to have you uh, uh, tonight with us. Um, February is known to be Black History Month. Um, unfortunately, we have to say it again. We don't have to talk about issues related to racism, to related to uh, black struggle, related to civil rights movement only in, in February. We don't have to do this. But we wanted to take this opportunity because everybody is, is tuned into this kind of, of programs, into this kind of uh, uh, subject. So we are so proud to have you educating us, informing us, sharing with us the knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you on a specific topic that we have chosen. The title of the presentation is how the black struggle uh, uh, helped uh, shaping the uh, uh, American Muslim identity or the American Muslim uh, experience. So uh, Dr. Abdel Malik is going to uh, give a presentation. It will be followed by Q and A. And I will share with you, inshallah, my dear brothers and sisters, the link uh, where you can post your uh, question to our guest speakers. Without, without any further ado, I know I, I talk a lot. Uh, Dr. Abdel Malik, you have the mic. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah khair. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Taha. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah ma'abad. The biggest accomplishment is that, alhamdulillah, Sheikh Taha is my sheikh and my imam, and I'm a product of uh, Islamic Center of San Diego. Uh, growing up in the masjid, alhamdulillah, it's, it's such an honor and privilege to come back and, and share the space with you all. Um, when, when discussing the topic uh, of, of, of anti-racism uh, in, in the context of Islam, it's always good in the Black American struggle. It's always important to really put things in the context. So inshallah, we're going to go over just Islam and the concept of racial justice and what's alluring to us to see the interconnected uh, um, challenges within the Muslim and the Black American experience, then also looking at Black history and its impact on the freedom struggle. And then inshallah, we're we'll looking at Black history, as Sheikh Taha mentioned, and its impact on daily lives, because Black history is world history, just more than American history. Great. So what really drew the parallels between the Muslim experience, American Muslim experience, and, and the Black experience is this notion that Islam was the most explicit uh, religion to call out racism. Um, and a lot of the traditions of early Muslims in this country stemmed out of that. They were really attracted to this concept of racial equity. And it's really in the Qutbah to uh, the, the farewell speech of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, all mankind is, is from Adam and Eve and the Arab has no superior over a non-Arab nor a non-Arab has superior over an Arab. Also white has no superior over a black nor a black has any superior over a white except in taqwa and piety. Um, and this concept of explicitly calling out this racial stratification was so alluring to people that were subjected in this country to racial injustice based upon slavery. And so if you also look at um, sort of Hijrat is very, very explicit, right? Uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, oh, oh humankind, we have made you into action, into nations and tribes so that you may get to know one another. And the no, no, most noble of you in God's sight is those who have the most piety. <laughs> so this explicit call out really attracted some of the early Muslims. Um, and so I'm gonna go contemporary and then I'm gonna go backwards inshallah. So I'm gonna play a quick clip of Malcolm X when he came back from Hajj and they were coming out of this racial um, reckoning and what he experienced in the Muslim world and what he wanted to share as an antidote to solve America's race problem. Malcolm, on your trip abroad, you said you sent a uh, feeling of great brotherhood while I was at Mecca making the pilgrimage. The, I spoke about the brotherhood that existed at all levels and among all people who were there on that Hajj who had accepted the religion of Islam. And I pointed out that uh, for what it had done, what the religion of Islam had done for those people over there, despite their complexion differences, that it would probably uh, do America well to study the religion of Islam and perhaps it could drive some of, some of the racism from this society as it has driven racism from the Muslim society. When I was in on the pilgrimage, I had close contact 
with Muslims whose skin would in America be classified as white and with Muslims who would themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and therefore they looked upon all other segments of the human family as part of that same family. Well, now, uh, they had a different look or a different air or a different attitude than that which is uh, reflected in the uh, attitude of the man in America who calls himself white. So I said that if uh, Islam had done that for them, perhaps if the white man in America would study Islam, perhaps they could do the same thing for him. So it was explicit experience of the most iconic figure in a post-racial America goes to Mecca to make Hajj, sees the eradication and the flattening of racial injustice amongst people when, when, he's, when he's doing tawaf. And he says, this is the antidote to America's racist problem. Not to say that it isn't racism that exists in our parts of the world, but if you truly practice Islam, if you follow the tenets of Islam, it'll bring about a concept of racial um, justice. And so where did this concept of, of practicing Muslims and black Americans really come into uh, uh, tangle with one another? So it's estimated through the transatlantic slave trade that about 10% this is a conservative estimate of the 12.5 million Africans who endured the Middle Passage, about 10.7 who survived were Muslims. So amongst them were teachers, students, um, mashayikh, um, artists, um, people actually have fought, memorized the Quran, traders, so on and so forth. Um, and so there's a book uh, really that I hope that we all can maybe look into it. It's called Africans, Muslims, Enslaved in Americas um, by Dr. Dioff. She really kind of goes over the transatlantic slave trade. If you look at a lot of the West African nations, these are a lot of majority Muslim countries. If you look at Senegal, if you look at Gambia, if you look at Nigeria, if you look at some of these countries in which um, Africans were extracted from and enslaved, they were Muslims. So the first people to practice Islam on this foot, on the soil that we're in were Muslims. And in fact, if you really look at a lot of the resistance, we talk about fighting for racial justice and fighting for equality, a lot of the people who fought in these resistance were Muslims, right? If you look at some of the earliest archives uh, in, in, in 1522, in the state of Christopher Columbus' son, which is now the Dominican Republic, the first people to rebel and the first uprisings uh, to make jihad against the dhulm and the oppression were Muslims. Uh, in December 1804, they started uprising uh, in Herman Melville and turned the episode into, there was actually a whole book about that. Um, and so they're also, they planned to sail back a ship in Senegal and they made a contract. They hijacked the ship and they made a contract in their language to have the person return them to, 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 to their safety and their freedom. Um, if you look at some of the accounts of the French um, and the Colonel, he mentioned that some of the papers that they found after they had killed uh, uh, the people who rebelled were in Arabic. And these were from the Muslims that organized through the tradition of resistance. So when you talk, when you talk about not just fighting for freedom and equality and justice, the first people to really do this on these lands Americas in general, whether it's the Dominican Republic, whether it's all the way in Haiti, whether it's in, in Colombia and Baha'i, um, in Lima and Peru, they were Muslims, right? So what do they use? They use these documents actually talk about, and they actually um, in the archives, this is actually in North Carolina. They used through their Islam, alhamdulillah, they used the Arabic language to form resistance, right? Because they were bilingual, they were able to really use ways in which they can communicate amongst themselves to pursue their freedom because they were literate, right? And they would communicate in this way to help start rebellions in the revolution to fight for their freedom. And this is actually archived in a lot of the documents because the literate people really, majority of the people that were literate that could read and write, subhanAllah, were Muslims. So it's interesting to see a country that was founded upon this enslavement of Africans, two, two three, three, 400 years later, tried to ban African Muslims who they took away their religion and, and, and helped build this country for free to their ancestors. Just the kind of the dichotomy of the racist mindset sometimes we live in. 
And so some of the early accounts mentioned um, here, um, there was, you know, the, the elite professor at Berkeley says there was an old African named Philip who was a very intelligent man, not a pagan, but they were referenced as Mohammedans. Um, he greatly interested by going through all the prayers and prostrations of his native country. One man mentioned that his grandfather owned slaves. They were devout Muslims, right, who prayed to Allah morning, noon, and evening, right? Um, a lot of them mentioned some of the early accounts um, that they would go and they'd be chanting, chanting, takbir, Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah, astaghfirullah, throughout the streets. And so some of the earlier people that we know that are archived in our history, for example, is Ayuba Suleiman Diallo. He was actually uh, of wealth. He was 16 years old, um, stolen and enslaved from Senegal. His father, he had kind of or, or arranged for his father to kind of help him buy out of slavery when he was abducted. Um, they took him to Maryland, present day Maryland, Annapolis, um, with 149 people. So he wasn't able to really get out of that. Well, subhanAllah, he was a hafid, he was a Quran teacher. And this is some of the manuscripts that is actually archived today. Um, they were really intrigued by him at the time that they actually sent him to London. And the founder of the colony or the state today known as Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, brought his freedom because he's really intrigued. And through the um, way he was able to write his letters, he wrote to his father and eventually got to freedom. And so they're really intrigued by this guy and he resisted. And he said, I'm going to wear my thold. I'm going to wear my egal. He's going to wear his uh, traditional turban. And this is a picture that was taken in London. They actually um, drew him um, and he resisted. A lot of the actual original people resisted and they wore the traditional uh, Islamic garb. And so this is one of the uh, um, really historical figures that actually was abducted into slavery, purchased out of slavery and came back. But because he was able to write in Arabic, he really drew the attention of a lot of the slave owners because he had a certain skill set that was really attractive and he knew the Quran very well. Another individual that's very famous, um, this is a picture of him in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, is Yaro Mamout. Um, he was, um, in fact, he died in his mid 90s. He was obviously abducted, became a slave, was enslaved, um, and until he was, um, he gained his freedom uh, at the age of 60. Then subhanAllah, Allah subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with finance and fortune and he had good skill sets. In fact, he owned stock of the Columbia Bank in Georgetown. He was a financier. And so he was actually able to trade and engage with people at a time it wasn't even possible. And it was because of his skill sets through his literacy. But he was so important because a lot of the early accounts talked about how he would walk through the streets of Georgetown saying Allahu Akbar and chanting Islamic slogans up and down. And so SubhanAllah, this is another individual to say that connecting, going back to the topic at hand, the black American struggle and the Muslim American struggle. The first people to establish the Eid, the first people to pray, the first people to invoke Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in his oneness in, this, in these lands were black Muslims. And so this whole notion of not just fighting for justice, but actually establishing Tawheed and fighting for equality and their right to, to worship really laid down the foundation for us to uh, benefit from all these opportunities to say it's really by black folks. But it wasn't always good. This is a collection um, a story of Omar bin Said. He's actually gonna become a documentary and movie pretty soon. He was actually a scholar. Um, and there are multiple documents of him writing a surah to Muluk and reading Quran. And they actually say he converted or he didn't convert. There's a huge confusion behind that, but he was forced into Christianity. Um, but he was known because he was a person that had talent and not just arithmetic, not just uh, you know, um, sciences, but also in the languages. And so he was able to really write. And some of the, um, um, I think most important documents that really captured the enslavement period in America reference him. He actually has a whole digitalized document, a collection to his name. Um, and so it's important to look at even the ways that the early black Americans were eradicated and stripped away of their Islam, of, of their humanity, of their language. And the people that resisted were able to really write this down. This is one of us, it was a scholar, a businessman, 
and really an intellectual genius. And a lot of his work is really um, uh, looked into nowadays. And so why is this important? Because the way that which racism is looked at is it actually goes against some of our misconceptions. We're often able to look, we're reluctant to acknowledge the legacies of race. I just gave you three examples of the legacies of race and the racialization of black folks in this country, particularly black Muslims. But we're more often talk about class and gender and immigration and other aspects and not really talk about how this society, the United States was really constructed as a race-based society, really at its root and its core. And so becoming an anti-racist requires us to be in these three zones. There's the fear zone, right? Where you avoid hard questioning, you deny racism as a problem, you strive to be comfortable. The learning zone as alhamdulillah where many of us as Muslims have to be. You try to gain um, privilege and understand that you ignoring racism is part of your privilege. You seek out questions, you educate yourself about race and structural racism and how it plays itself out. Um, and the growth zone is really when you speak out against racism in action. So hope, inshallah ta'ala, that we move from the fear zone to the learning zone to the growth zone. So when you say the Black American struggle is directly connected to American Muslim struggle, it is 100% accurate because I'm Black American Muslims built this country for free. And in fact, not just the millions of dollars that were stripped of their religion, that were stripped of their humanity, as we just saw, but there's documentation of this. Documentation in the museums and the archives of this. So why is it difficult to talk again? Because race is a social construct, but racism has real life impact. And so we need to define racism. And the ways that which we define racism is really, uh, Ojuma Lu has a phenomenal book. And she says, it's any prejudice against someone because of their race, when those views are reinforced by systems of power, right? And so the systems of power and the construct of a post-colonial society is entertainment. The movies that we make out, the music that we make out, labor, the laws that come out, right? The Muslim ban, right, stop and frisk, the politics of it, right, um, religion, how that's weaponized. We just talked about how religion was weaponized. Um, sex, war, and economics, object, object, objectification of people, right, uh, the war, the countries in which we want to fight, which we want to invade, and the economics, the people that we want to sanction or not. And so all of this is part, and obviously education or the miseducation. All these are systemic, what we call tools of power that are reinforced by race. So Nellie Fuller says, if you don't understand white supremacy, what it is, how it works, everything else you understand will only confuse you. And so racism has four levels. There's a personal, there's a private beliefs that we have, the prejudice ideas that individuals have, right? Um, then there's the interpersonal. If I have a racist idea, then I talk to Sheikh Taha and I may manifest that in my interaction with him. That's the, at the interpersonal level. Then we have institutional racism. That's when we organize policies and practices and we treat people through our organization and institutions. So a police officer now is part of the law enforcement institution. A teacher is part of the educational institution, right? Or the school system. And so a bank loaner who doesn't who denies your loan is not part of the uh, banking or the finance institution. And then there's a structural piece. And this is where those systems come together. So all of the law enforcement agencies, whether it's TSA, whether it's, you know, FBI, whether it's, you know, Homeland Security, right, whether it's Border Patrol, whether it's SDPD, all that's part of a structural uh, piece of law enforcement. Same thing with the schools, there's K through 12, there's private, there's public, there's charter, there's college, university, all that now is part of a structural. So they, if they then start to enforce policies and procedures that are racist, it becomes structural racism. So when people talk about racism, we confuse bigotry, bias, um, you know, we confuse things such as um, um, uh, explicit, implicit bias and private beliefs as prejudice with structural or institutional racism, which has power. So here's some personal thoughts that people have that are racist, right? Black people are thugs, Mexicans are rapists, Asians eat bats, Muslims are terrorists. These are certain racist things that we've heard before. At the interpersonal level, we start to see people cluster purse, they cross the street, they don't invite people to eat out. They, at the airports, they gaze and stare at you, right? This is called microaggressions. So remember after 9-11, if you see something, do something, 
they were actually telling people to racially profile Muslims in airports because they were suspicious. Just as they tell black people to be racially profiled because they look suspicious. They're, they're not supposed to be here. They look like a certain thing, right? So these are interpersonal manifestations, again, connecting the black and the American Muslim struggle. And then at institutional level, we saw these institutions being weaponized, right? So the TSA was an institution that really weaponized through Homeland Security random checks for a lot of Muslims, right? We saw the policing for stop and frisk. We see school suspension rates for black and brown youth, right? And then at the structural, we see the preschool prison pipeline. We see the Muslim ban. We see children in cages. We see a redlining. We see mass incarceration. And we see denying of bank loans. So when you see policies like how the kids end up in cages or how did they ban Muslims, it's very easy to believe that if you personally believe that black people are thugs, Mexican rapists and Muslims are terrorists. It's easy to ban them. You see how racism goes to the personal, interpersonal, institutional, and structural. And so we have to look at ways in which people in positions, when they say things that are racist, are very, very dangerous, and they're reinforced, again, by these systems of power, the institutions and the structure. So that's kind of a context of racism. How then I want to move forward to Muslims and politics. And again, I want to connect this thought with the Black American struggle and the Muslim American struggle. Currently, there are three Muslim Congress folks, Rashida Tlaib, Andre Carson, and Ilhan Omar. Two out of the three are Black. But the two sisters that are recent Congresswomen, their seats were vacated by Black men. So the three Muslim Congress people that we have representing us at the federal level have either been Black or their seats were preceded by Black people. Again, Black Americans laying the foundations for Muslims. And this is how our struggle is connected, even politically. And so if you look at, I want to give you another example. As Black Americans, we're truly the ambassadors of Islam. So we talked about you know, uh, pre-civil rights. But let's go to the civil rights era. Muhammad Ali, when he resisted going to the Vietnam War, and Eric, uh, former Attorney General Eric Holder said that his biggest win came out in the ring, but in our course in his fight for his beliefs. It was Islam. Not politics. It was Islam that he resisted going to Vietnam. And we have to always understand that. We have to put that. And he says in his famous thing, I asked Allah, and I love this quote by him, when he says, I asked Allah for wealth, and he gave me Islam. And this is a famous picture of him in the press conference when all of these athletes, these are the greatest athletes of our time, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the greatest basketball player, Jim Brown, the greatest football player, Wilt Chamberlain, and Muhammad, they tried to convince him to just, you know, not to make a deal with the president. And he said, no, he convinced them to stand with him against the United States. And that's how strong his faith was. But not just there. There's a story here that I want to share with y'all that many of us may not know. In 2003, the city of Lewiston, Maine, uh, was going through a lot of immigration and a lot of Somali immigrants started coming there. And the mayor of the town, um, who was pretty racist, said, he wrote an op-ed right here, a letter to the Somali community. And he said, stop coming here. You guys are bankrupting the city. We can't handle you. You know, please stop immigrating here. Now, Maine, you have to understand, was 98% white. I mean, the only thing whiter in Maine than white people is snow. I mean, it's 98% white, right? Not only that, in Black Hawk Down, in Mogadishu, the, uh, there was an American soldier that was dragged, and he was from this town, and there was a freeway named after him. So not only did they have anti, uh, you know, Black tendencies, but also Islamophobia, but also specifically to the Somali community. So the coalition came to really resist the oppression of the mayor. And amongst them, was the NAACP and a lot of people. Muhammad Ali wrote a letter. He took a letter in the same journal, same uh, magazine as the mayor. And he said, this is something very, very important that I uh, quote. He said, between those who embrace bigotry, he said, between those who embrace bigotry and those who embrace freedom, Ali recalled 1965, he said, in which he knocked out Sonny Liston, he blamed Mayor Ramsey, he said he was irresponsible, insensitive, and inflammatory. And he said the many and one coalition has my full support. Why was this important? Lewiston, Maine was where Muhammad Ali fought for the first time under the name Muhammad Ali. He was Cassius Clay before. This city was significant to him 
because he defended his title against Sonny Liston. He was the underdog. And he said, this is the city that I first fought as a Muslim. And so you, these people are my Muslim brothers and sisters that you're going to welcome them. And they made a documentary about this um, five or six years ago. And he wrote another letter. And at the bottom of the letter, he says this. It's very, very important. He says, it is ironic that Sonny was the town's favorite to win the match and reclaim the World Heavyweight title that night. And today it is for me, Muhammad Ali, Sonny's opponent, who arrived in Lewiston for the first time after changing his name and converting to Islam, who is being embraced. I am humble and I, that I still provoke conversation, interest in this community, but feel blessed to be remembered by so many. I want to thank the citizens of Lewiston for continuing to make me a part of your community and history. And thank you for opening your hearts, minds, and community to my Muslim brothers and sisters. So again, the Black American struggle connected to the American Muslim struggle. When there was anti-immigration resistance, it was a Black Muslim man, the heavyweight champion, the GOAT, that stood up for this community and leveraged his personality, leveraged, leveraged his celebrity, but used Islam as a vessel of justice. Um, inshallah, I know we have, we're, we're really slow on time here, but I want to kind of go to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as, as another famous person. We talk about Ma Michael Jordan being the GOAT. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has as much championships at the NBA level, but more in the NCAA, more MVPs, more points, more everything, and he was a Muslim. And in fact, he went, him and Oscar Robinson went to coach the uh, new country such as Somalia when they became independent nations back home. And he was really stood up against Trump and his policies. So we see, lastly, I want to I pivot here. Sheikh Taha mentioned that it's not always revolution or resistance or civil rights, like black contributions are part of everyday society, right? So as Muslims, I know there's, there's a huge percent of us in, in tech and STEM and in um, the medical industry. So I wanna just quickly talk about some of the contributions of black genius. So Dr. Shirley Jackson, she is the first woman to get her, black woman to get her doctorate in nuclear physics at MIT. She created what's called today the touchstone telephone, the caller ID, the fiber optic table. There is no way that any human being can walk around the world without using a touchstone telephone. The technology that we use today, the foundation for that and call waiting and caller ID was laid by a black woman, a black American woman. But we have this notion that black Americans are lazy, they're not contributing on welfare. But in fact, we are every single day benefiting from their genius. Louis Lattimore, famous individual, he's the one that drafted the Alexander Graham Bell telephone. He, in, he improved the railroad car system and early air conditioning unit. If you ever use your air conditioning, you can go ahead and thank this black man for doing that. Marie Brown, she, she created what's today considered the closed circuit television security. So alhamdulillah, all our massages in our homes are protected through the security system. It was a black woman who was a nurse who created the technology and laid down the foundation for that. Her early system had push buttons and trigger warnings and traffic monitoring and it actually triggered the, um, the, the authorities to show up. And so our patent laid down the foundation for that. I'm gonna go over this quickly and I'll go over the question and answer. Um, Otis Boykin, he created the pacemaker. How many Muslims and how many human beings have benefited from the pacemaker? His mother, um, subhanAllah, you know, died of heart failure. And he said, I want to create something. And he also created the IBM computer. So how many people have been impacted by this? Charles Drew, the concept of the blood bank. How many of us have donated blood or received blood or been saved by that? It was a black man, Charles Drew, who was a, there's a hospital or school named after him in LA. He, all, he invented the blood mobile. And he left the American Red Cross even though he invented this technology because they were being segregationist with the ways in which they distributed the blood, subhanAllah. So even in the face of his invention, he was still facing racial oppression. Lonnie Johnson, also, you guys know the super soaker, pretty famous, uh, but he also has 40 patents to his name. Um, voice over technology. This is Marie Croak. She works as a senior vice president at AT&T. Uh, she laid down the foundation for over 135 patents, including the voice over IP. If you ever, can, if you ever text messaging GIFs with a moving animation, the lady who developed that is a black woman. Her name is Lisa uh, Gallobutter. She's actually a vice president uh, of BET, but now she's the chief digital service officer with the US Department of Education. Philip Ngawe, he created the world's fastest computer, 3.1 billion calculations in a second. 
3.1 billion. He's actually dubbed the Bill Gates of Africa because he dropped out of high school at a very young age as well. Jesse Wilkinson Jr. graduated his PhD at the age of 19 in mathematics. He developed what's today the gamma radiation model in mathematics out of Chicago. Eli, Elijah McCoy, you've heard the term, I want the real McCoy. He was the one that really revolutionized the steam engine and railroad industry and provided the lubricant for transportation to be really um, um, streamlined in, in the industrial revolution. And he has over 50 inventions to his name. And last but not least, Garrett Morgan created the gas mask. We tell you what's about go wearing a mask, the foundation for the gas mask. How many people have been saved by the gas mask? Firefighters, you know, people uh, that go into world wars. The gentleman named Garrett Mer Morgan was the person who created that, but he also created the traffic signal. So the green, yellow, and red every single day, you might wanna thank a black person for not getting into a car accident because the person who came up with that and how that technology has been exported to the world was a black man, Gary, Garrett Morgan. And then um, last but not least, the walker that we have today, the tissue holder, the sanitary belt were created by two sisters, Mary and Mildred Davidson. And Mary created this, what she had suffered from uh, multiple sclerosis. And so I say that black lives more than matter, black lives have saved lives. It's deeply connected to the, uh, the, the struggle that we have uh, as a people. So inshallah, I don't wanna kind of stop there. I know we're gonna get some questions inshallah. I'll stop sharing, but I wanted to just recap a little bit that the ways in which our miseducation has impacted us, has taken away all these inventions and contributions that we use in our daily lives from black Americans, but also as Muslims, that we stand on the shoulders, whether it's politically, whether it's socially, uh, whether it's um, even intellectually with our contributions of the you know, of black Americans. So Jazakallah khair, barakallah fikum, assalamu alaikum. And anything that came from uh, me that is good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anything that is bad is from the shaitan. And so, uh, Shaykh Ta'ala, I'll turn it over to you for any questions, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, uh, dear brother, uh, Dr. Abdul Malik. Um, we, uh, we have uh, someone anonymous saying, just wanted to say Jazakallah khair for all the work you do for the community, Dr. Bull, much love. Jazakallah khair, uh, whoever is this person, a brother or a sister. So it's, it's very important, you know, you, you went back to the very first uh, Muslim enslaved people and you have mentioned some of the very well-known uh, names and you reminded me of my favorite one, uh, uh, Abdul Rahman Ibrahim Asori. Uh, you know, the, the PBS uh, published um, a movie about his life a few years ago that we screen all, you know, often here at, at the Islamic Center uh, about his life. Uh, a great man, a great man. He was the very first uh, uh, enslaved person freed by the US government because of his intellectuality. He spoke several languages. Uh, he tried to, uh, to run away as many of the enslaved people he failed, but again, he became the very first person to, to be released by the government. And he went back, <clears throat> I think to Liberia or Sierra Leone, I think Liberia. He went back to Africa and he died over there. And he was not allowed to take his kids with him. So the separation between parents and kids that we have seen in the last few years is not something new, unfortunately. It is very well rooted in the history of our nation, unfortunately. Uh, Dr. Abdel Malik, uh, often we, we hear this, uh, this uh, uh, sentence, this statement, we stand on the shoulders of the giants. When we talk about the civil rights movement, when we talk about the efforts of Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and many leaders of the uh, uh, civil rights movement, what does this mean for us as Muslims now going through this struggle you know, since 9-11 with a Muslim ban, with, uh, you know, all the bigotry and Islamophobia, what does this mean for us when we look behind, when we look at the black struggle during the civil rights movement? How, how, how should we understand this and how can we benefit from that struggle? 
Well, Zach, that's, that's, that's a very ex that's an excellent question. Um, there's a pretty famous uh, proverb that says, those who don't know their history are, do are doomed to repeat it. Um, as you mentioned, um, the playbook um, in terms of a lot of these oppressive systems is not new. Um, <laughs> and there have been um, traditional historical uh, legacies of resistance um, through the civil rights uh, uh, and Jim Crow era of black Americans that as Muslims, we can definitely uh, draw from. And subhanAllah, the, the benefit for us really as, as Muslims, like a lot of these folks, as you mentioned, were Muslims. You know, you look at Muhammad Ali, you look at, you know, Malcolm X, um, these people were Muslim. And so two, two things that's very important. When you look at, for example, um, the hyper surveillance and the profiling in a post 9-11 era with law enforcement, whether it's TSA, whether it's counterintelligence programs, these were the same programs that were really used to dismantle a lot of the resistant groups, whether it's the Black Panther Party, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, the nation. A lot of these people were being sur surveillanced really uh, by America's law enforcement. And so this is something that's not new. And so a lot of the civil liberty laws that were sent out to um, protect us from having our civil liberties and our private security being infringed upon was really emanated from the Black American struggle in the civil rights era, right? And so that's something that we always have to look at. Um, politically, you also made a very good connection that separation of families has been the story of America. They separated enslaved people. Uh, as soon as a child became of age, they would take them and rip them away from their um, families, right? This whole uh, immigration fiasco that we've seen, this is something that is not new to us as well. Um, these exclusionary acts that bans particular Muslims, um, the problem or the challenge that we have now is a lot of us Muslims have been on the sidelines. And they, there's, there's, a, there's a statement in politics that say, if you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. And subhanAllah, because we didn't connect with our Black American friend, you know, um, predecessors when it came to this country, and we kind of subscribe to this notion of assimilation in this country, and they're saying, don't be like them, they were going through historical oppression, we didn't really understand that tomorrow would also be on the menu. So subhanAllah, today we're on the menu um, through the Muslim ban, through, uh, you know, in a post 9-11 era. And so I see that we have to go back to the drawing board of building coalitions, building collaborations, standing up against injustice, because the first people that have always stood behind us when it came to these injustices were the black Americans. So I think we have an opportunity now uh, going forward to really um, um, you know, stand shoulder to shoulder and side by side with the black Americans. And that's not just in the context of police brutality because we face brutality in law enforcement when we travel through the airport and we get stopped at first. We get groped, we, we have our humanity really, uh, you know, uh, emasculated or, you know, um, taken away from us. Some of the men, we see some of our sisters being touched inappropriately, right? Uh, because of the secondary screening. So um, it's not just a hyper vigilance of a scarf being pulled from me as you go shopping, but it's also engaging the law enforcement in the various ways in which we do. So we have to be very cognizant that when this oppression happens against other communities, we also have to stand up against that injustice. Mm -hmm. Jazakallah khair, very important, very important. Uh, brother, Dr. Abdul Malik, um, we have seen last summer something that maybe America didn't see for decades after the tragedy of uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and before them, uh, Trevon Martin, Eric Garner, Mike Brown, and the long, the list goes on and on. But last summer, we have seen a movement. We have seen, um, a, you know, protests all over the nation and even worldwide. And what we have noticed is that the involvement of so many young Muslims in these protests not only joining as individuals, but representing the community and being in the leadership of these protests, you know, organizing and, and directing and speaking in the rallies and so on. Um, what's, what's your take on this? What, you know, how do you see this? Is it, is it like a, a, a real wake up that we have seen within our community, especially the young brothers and sisters in the community and, and what, what kind of advice do you, get, do you give to our young brothers and sisters who felt 
the the urgency of of you know stepping out joining and being part of the protest part of the movement that's a very excellent question um with george floyd um particularly we saw for eight minutes and 30 something odd seconds a man who was tortured tortured um and it touched and awakened not just the core and the humanity and morality of the consciousness of just Americans, but as you mentioned, globally, worldwide. Because in that moment, subhanAllah, as that video was shown, people said that even animals, Shafaha, had more compassion. Mm. You know, the, the predator, whether it's a shark or a lion or a cheetah, when it attacks its prey, it snaps the neck so the death is quick. But for someone to have eight minutes as their life oozes out of them and they cry out for their mother, everyone saw that. So it touched people in a certain way. And so that emotion uh, and that, that evoked a certain response for people. And as Muslims, we should have this humanity. Mm. We should have this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, you know, the sanctity of life in numerous ayat, right? And so I think that was part of the moral or the racial reckoning that this country went through. And so to see the Muslim youth really be on the front lines of um, utilizing this as a platform to fight for justice is important. My recommendation uh, to the youth, and this is me included, is to use our Islamic principles of justice and equity and the compassion of life and mercy as the guiding principles of this movement, just as Muhammad Ali used it just as Malcolm used it, right? And not to use any other uh, method, because yes, of course, there's other methods out there, but you should really make this as an act of ibadah, as an act of worship, and be compelled through that, because there's nothing more powerful <laughs> than you see when both of those come together, when both of those come, the, the moral awakening and the deen. And that's why, subhanAllah, in that moment, it's not a coincidence, Shaykh Taha, that a black Muslim attorney general named Keith Ellison is taking on the case of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. It's not a coincidence, right? That the attorney general at the moment couldn't handle it and then he took it from him and they gave it to a black Muslim Congress, former congressman. Um, and so subhanAllah, it's kind of, again, going back to that connection. So we have to always be very, very cognizant and aware that our drive and our cause should be really emanated from our, from our deen because that is what's going to be more sustaining. That is also what's going to be helping us not embark upon certain um, safeguards that the deen has set for us as well, and not to transgress upon people in our fight for justice. Jazakallah khair. Um, okay, I have a question here. I don't know where, okay, let me get it back. No, I lost it. But I, I remember the question is why during the Black History Month, um, why during the Black History Month, the, okay, I have to get it back. You know, I, I, I mess with my screen and <laughs> I'm so sorry. I am so but sorry. But I can make a comment about just Black History Month in general, that, yes. that Black History Month is, is, is more than revolution. It's part yes. of evolution. Oh, he, he, here's the question. Here's the, I got it. I got it back. So why, why doesn't Black History Month talks much about the rich Islamic history association, association uh, associated with it? Oh, because that, that would make you um, liberated. That would make you free. That would make mm. you more just. That would make you uh, eradicate racial injustice. <laughs> so it's part mm. of, again, it's part of, of, of the ways in which the systems of power are used to suppress people, right? To make them think certain things. So um, we wanna keep certain narratives about, and that's why it's important for us uh, to not allow others to educate us, right? Islam, the first I ever, Iqar, we, the first thing ever revealed, right? So we have to mm. live with ourselves in our mind and read and educate ourselves and not rely on others to educate us. So um, absolutely it's part of the programming and part of learning is unlearning and Carter G. Wishton has a phenomenal book, the, the gentleman who founded Black History Month, uh, which is Negro Spiritual Week initially, they became Black History Month, his name is Carter G. Wishton. 
He has a phenomenal book called The Miseducation of the Negro. It's called The Miseducation mm. of the Negro. And he talks about why this is part of the psychological programming and conditioning of people to not learn their history. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are the questions that, that we have um, and we are almost uh, nine. Uh, Dr. Abdel Malik, uh, any last word that you want to leave with us uh, for the whole community, especially for the youth? Uh, you, you have mentioned something very important, uh, uh, very nice advice, nasiha to the youth whenever they get engaged uh, in, in, in uh, protesting against, against uh, injustice, uh, racial injustice, for example, always to carry out with them uh, their, their uh, Islamic values, their Islamic principles. And this is what, what makes us distinguished. I mean, we do, have, we do have in our deen a lot of tools, a lot of teachings. And believe me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very involved in the interfaith work and Sometimes when I attend rallies and I speak, for example, like, like uh, economic justice, when I go, uh, uh, I mean, before COVID, of course, I go and speak at a rally to support the workers of the janitors of the uh, hotel, you know, for example. And I just tell them, I, I, you know, I share the, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ajira ajra qabla an araqa, pay, the worker, his dues before his sweat, you know, dries. Wallahi, I had people coming to me to tell me who said who said this, and I'm like Prophet Muhammad sallallahu They couldn't believe this, and this is a hadith, a very well known hadith, you know, just just sharing the the beauty, the beautiful uh, texts, the beautiful values and principles of our Deen will make a huge difference. Will make a so. We have a lot of to offer, you know. We don't have to assimilate. We don't have to do everything others are doing. We can be with them, but we have our own things that we can offer to empower this this movement, anti-racist movement, anti you know uh, bigotry and and uh, all that stuff. So, what else you can leave with us before we close, inshallah? Uh, two things, um, as you mentioned. Um, this is notion that I've been grappling or grappling with lately, and it's that I'm going to be rooted in and not restricted by my deen. I'm going to be rooted in and not restricted by my deen, my religion. When someone is rooted in their religion, it's like a power base. A tree has strong roots. Its foundation is strong. Then the fruits of its labor, inshallah, are going to be good. But if you view it as a restriction, you have to have a paradigm shift. As a restriction, it becomes problematic. I can't do this, I can't. Be rooted in your deen. Because once you're rooted in your deen, the way you move, the way you engage, the work is much different. As you mentioned, you're engaging economic justice, leveraging the ayat and the hadith talking about economic justice, right? And so that even gives us as Muslims a different dynamic to, and perspective to say, wow, these are principles within our religion. There's a phenomenal article uh, that, a non-Muslim wrote, it's called Islam's anti-racist message in the seventh century still resonates today, right? And he talks about this non-Muslim, uh, you know, uh, scholar mentions that Islam actually has explicit, not implicit, like hidden explicit anti-racist racist, uh, messaging that appealed people to Islam. And so we talk about this even the non-Muslims are going to Islam to find justification and morality in that. So why are we going to that which is already in here? Mm -hmm. So, be, but if you root it in it and you come from it and that's what's your guiding principle and values, then inshallah, you don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, be rooted in and not restricted by your culture, by your deen as you move about this work. Um, the second piece that's also very, very important um, that I hope all of us can really understand uh, when it comes to, to this work, is that there are forms and traditions in which we can collaborate, in which we can really um, formulate coalitions. Um, 
And we have to display our Islamic cultures and values because the discipline that Islam brings, the discipline, the, the beauty of it is such an attractive quality. That's why in the prison system, huge people, population convert to Islam because the level of discipline, right? The level of just um, submission to this cause. So inshallah ta'ala, I hope that we really, really reflect and we think back because what we need to do to eradicate racism is touch back into our humanity. We all have ears. Some of us hear and some of us listen. Listening is different than hearing. Listening requires open heart and open mind. We all have hands. Some of us can touch. Some of us can feel. Like when I shake, when I hug Shakhtar, I feel him. I feel the love. It's much different than just, hey, it's not alaykum, you know. When we all have eyes, some of us can see and some of us have vision, insight, foresight, hindsight, what could be, what shouldn't be. So let's use our senses and humanity to touch into who we are as core as Muslims. And inshallah, let's make this world a better place than we came into it. Let, let, let that our be our legacy as ambassadors of Islam. Whether we like it or not, we are all ambassadors of Islam. When I go to my work as a professor, I'm an ambassador of Islam. Whether I choose that title or not, they know I'm Muslim. I have to conduct myself in a way, in a manner that is Islamic. So inshallah ta'ala, I hope that we all understand this responsibility. So I want all of us, no matter what your profession is, no matter what your role is, to really look at yourself as ambassadors to Islam, countering these messages. Because we know that our deen says, our Quran says, a death to one person, it's like a death to all of humanity. Like, so the injustice and the sanctity of life, Allah tells us in the Quran, the severity of that life. So we shouldn't be screaming any life matters because our deen already tells us that, right? So let's be powered and rooted in our deen, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, Jazakallah khair. You, you reminded me about something that I often say. I say that a Muslim by default is an activist. So activism is not an option that we, no, we are by default an activist because our deen taught us that whenever we see something wrong, we have to do something about it. al amru bil ma'ruf wa nay al munkar. You know, to promote that which is good and, and to forbid and challenge that which is unjust, that which is evil, wrong, you know, immoral in the community. So just by understanding this concept, and this concept is not from furu' al-deen, the branches of it. No, this concept al-amr ma'ruf wa al munkar is one of the core teachings of Islam. And this is what makes a Muslim uh, an activist by default, because when we see the wrong, we cannot keep quiet. We cannot be passive. We think about something that we should say, that we should do to push back the wrong and bring about the good and the right thing to the, to the community. And I, I'm, I'm sure you agree with me on this. That's, that's what made us the best of humanity. Why? Exactly. This is, this is the reason of, of Al Khair. Yeah, that Allah, we became the best of humanity. Why? Because we enjoy the good, we forbid the evil. And the beautiful thing, Shaykh that you remind me of now is even that injustice against yourself, even if you are the one oppressing, to stop yourself from this injustice. Yeah. MashaAllah, great conversation. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair, uh, brother uh, Dr. Abdul Malik. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, bless your uh, family, and grant you the best in this life and the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all the brothers and sisters who have joined us, who watched this conversation, this presentation. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and keep blessing our community by individuals and leaders like our dear brother Dr. Abdul Malik and many other brothers and sisters in the community. There is subhanAllah an increasing number of activists and leaders in our community who are doing great job and this is what makes me always always optimistic about the future of our community not only in San Diego but the entire United States of America. Our future is bright, our future is shining we have to be part of it. We have to do something. We, and, you know, everyone 
is equipped with something that he or she can contribute with. I'm not an eloquent speaker, but I can do something else, right? So every one of us can do something for the betterment of our community. And let's keep in mind, the betterment of our community means the betterment of our larger society and our entire nation, our entire world. We have a beautiful things to offer. We should not be selfish and keep that for ourselves. We have to share it with other people who are around us. Again, Jazakumullah Khair, Barakallah Fikum, Hafizakumullah. See you soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam.